So here we are, the final session for uh, this semester. This study has been in Daniel. We've called it uh, Courage and Chaos. The chaos continues. Uh, just as kind of a joke, last week, before we actually got going, as guys were coming in and before we prayed, and that's not recorded, that, that uh, <clears throat> it's... Uh, we're just, just kind of having a little discussion before we actually turn on the, uh, the recording and the, uh, the video. But in, I, I, I was just kind of talking about what was going on, and I said last week, just jokingly, tongue-in-cheek, I mean, you know, the way things are going, they might, they might actually... We, oh, I, I said next week, which is this week, next week will be our last session for the semester because we always knock off the week before Thanksgiving. But who knows, Thanksgiving may be canceled. And then I heard today as I was driving back from the noon study that the governor of Washington State actually canceled Thanksgiving. That's funny, I mean, it is funny. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of hubris there. It was Lord Acton who said, all power corrupts but absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we're just watching all this. The, uh, the love of power, the intoxication of power, of control, of being in charge. Of, there, there was a book 30 years ago called Looking Out for Number One. And isn't it interesting to observe these governors and these speaker of houses with their large refrigerators full of ice cream, who love to be in control, who look out for number one, who, um, who, who, uh, who, who make mandates for everyone, but when it comes to themselves are utterly exempt. That is a travesty. It's a joke. That's not leadership, that is tyranny. You've got tyranny in the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel is so relevant to where we are right now. That's why we're in the book of Daniel. We're watching uh, in this power grab that's going on around us, we're watching a lot of uh, liberties being taken away. You may have read some of the remarks from Justice Samuel Alito recently that were given at a keynote address before the Federalist Society. Jim Dennison, in his uh, newsletter, actually this morning quoted some of that. I'll read it to you. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito recently stated during a keynote address Quote, it pains me to say this, but in certain quarters, religious liberty is fast becoming a disfavored right. Citing the little sisters of the poor who refuse to allow their health insurance plan to provide contraceptives, and Masterpiece Cake Shop, whose owner refused to create a cake celebrating a same-sex wedding, he observed, for many today, religious liberty is not a cherished freedom. It's often just an excuse for bigotry, and it can't be tolerated, even when there is no evidence that anybody has been harmed. Justice Alito added, even before the pandemic, there was growing hostility to the expression of unfashionable views. And that, too, was a surprising development. Here's a marker, Alito said. Back in 72, 1972, the comedian George Carlin began to perform a routine called The Seven Words You Can't Say on TV. Today, you can see shows on your TV screen 
in which the dialogue appears at times to consist almost entirely of those words, which you couldn't say on TV in 72. Carlin's list seems like a quaint relic, but it would be easy to put together a new list called Things You Can't Say If You're a Student or Professor at a College or University or an Employee of Many Big Corporations. And there wouldn't be just seven items on that list. Seventy times seven would be closer to the mark. Justice Alito goes on, he says, I won't go down the list, but I'll mention one that I've discussed in a published opinion. You can't say that marriage is the union between one man and one woman. Until very recently, that's what the vast majority of Americans thought. Now it's considered bigotry. End of quote. We are watching freedoms being taken away before our eyes on a daily basis. Steve Cleary is CEO of Revelation Media. They do a lot of excellent Christian movies and Christian history series. He sent out, uh, he sent out an email last month, and I saved it for when we would address Daniel 3. So I'm going to read it tonight. And he says, dear friends, Sabina Wormbrand, wife of renowned pastor Richard Wormbrand, once told her husband, I do not need a coward for a husband. Uh, these may seem like harsh words, but please allow me to explain the context. The Russian communists had invaded their homeland of Romania and convened a Congress on the cults to promote communist ideology among the leaders of the major denominations in Romania. One after the other, pastors and priests pledged support for the communist. Sabina then whispered in her husband's ear, they are spitting on the face of Christ. Will you not speak up? Richard answered, if I speak, you'll no longer have a husband. To which Sabina replied, I do not need a coward for a husband. Now, there's an interesting woman. <laughs> I mean, so Richard spoke up and told his fellow leaders that they should serve Christ and Christ alone. He was arrested shortly thereafter and would spend 14 grueling years in prison for his Christian stance. You can read his book, Tortured for Christ. Sabina lost her husband for 14 years. She was also arrested, forced into slave labor on the Danube Canal. Neither were cowards, and both became my spiritual heroes and mentors. And then he goes on and says, this week I was studying the life of John Bunyan and was equally inspired by his words and actions when he was asked if he agreed to stop preaching. So John Bunyan lived in the 1600s he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress has sold more books than any other book in the world other than the Bible. And he wrote a number of other books while he was in prison. He was a, uh, he was a soldier, battle-hardened. He was a hell-raiser. They had a lot of open-air preachers back then, and it was his hobby to harass open-air preachers, throw stuff at them, uh, give them a hard time, just get them to get down off the open air preaching and shut it all down. And as he was doing that one day, the preacher was quoting a verse and it cut right through his heart. And he, he was convicted by the Holy Spirit and fell on his knees and asked Christ to come into his life and to forgive him of his sins. And he became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became the most powerful preacher in England. And he was a guy who sold pots and pans and repaired them. But he was quite the communicator. He was drawing, he became an open air preacher and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds were coming to know Christ. So they put him in jail. He had a wife, he had three or four or five, I can't remember the exact number, little children. He had a little daughter who was blind. And if you go to, um, 
if you go to that town in which he preached, and I, it was, uh, I believe it's Bedford, England. When we were in London, Mary and I drove up there, and one of the churches had done a museum of John Bunyan's life, and they had constructed a cell, the cell that he was in for 12 years. It had a, uh, they had a night cell and a day cell. The night cell is just what would be a normal jail cell. And at night, he would go into that. But he could open the door. The jailer would open the door at breakfast. He would walk out of his day cell into a larger cell with a desk and writing materials. And there, they would let him write. He couldn't preach, but he could write. That's where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. That's where he wrote Grace Abounding. That's where he wrote uh, these books that to this day change people's lives because they're so biblical. Um, and the sentence that was rendered to him is that he was free to leave. He was free to walk out of that jail at any time as long as he agreed not to preach the gospel of Christ. And he couldn't do it. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And when his wife and children, who were just very poor, church folks were trying to help them, but they were in poverty. And when they would come to visit, it would break his heart, especially when his little blind daughter would want to hold on to him and not let go. And he said when they left, it was like someone pulling the muscle off the bone. It was painful. Uh, normally, someone who would preach the gospel would only be in prison for three months. He was in there for 12 years because he refused to compromise. John Bunyan replied to the offer of compromise, I will stay in prison till the moss grows on my eyelids rather than disobey God. We don't know, we, we, we've not known anything like this in this country, but things are moving so quickly Things are moving so rapidly. There is so much, there, there is so much fracture in our society. There's so much overreach. There's such a lust for power. We, we are creating a fantasy land politically. I mean, Disneyland is closed in California, but fantasy land in Washington, D.C., is alive and well. I mean, we're just, they're making stuff up. Offices that don't exist. It's, it's a joke. It's a game if it wasn't so serious. And these are the times in which we're living. And again, if you weren't depressed when you walked in here, <laughs> allow me to help you. But no, you're aware of this. You know what's going on. What a line. I do not need a coward for a husband. What, what, um, what a challenge. And her husband wasn't a coward. And what respect. Richard Wormbrand. In fact, Revelation Media has made a movie about his life <clears throat> because he was not a coward. The punishment that he endured for all those years, he never compromised, he never recanted. We have not had to deal with this, but it's coming to a, uh, it's coming to a theater near, near, near you. It's coming to a church near you. It's, uh, we're headed in that direction unless the Lord intervenes and gives us more time. 
So Daniel 3 is of great import for us, great lessons in Daniel 3 for us. So I'd invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. And I want to give you in Daniel 3, and this is a very well-known story. This, Daniel is not in Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. And of course the question comes up, where's Daniel? Daniel. And different commentators, whatever commentary you read on the book of Daniel, most of them have some kind of theory about where Daniel, where he was. Uh, some are very interesting, but they're just theories. We don't know where he was. We can say this, if he had been with the th his three buddies, he'd be right with them in the fiery furnace. Because he, 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 was, he was of one heart with these guys. So we don't know where Daniel was, but we know where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. I want to give you three, I'll go ahead and give you three principles about these guys, and then we'll read the text and work our way through it. And I want to give you three reasons why these three men were not cowards. The, when, 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 uh, when the heat gets turned up in the church, The, the false believers hit the road. When the heat gets turned up in the church, you have what you, we, we call professing believers. Professing believers are all mouth. They're all mouth. Some of them have been raised in church. They can quote scripture with their mouth. They can sing hymns with their mouth. But there's no heart. Jesus does not rule and reign in their hearts. It's just mouth. It's just another thing on their resume. You don't want to be a professing Christian because if you're just a professing Christian, you're not saved and you will spend eternity apart from God. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We cast out demons. We did works of power. And I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Which is a, incredible. Not, well, I used to know you and you fell away. No, that's not, I never knew you. You've been a fraud from the beginning. You're a false believer. You're a counterfeit believer. When persecution hits the church, what persecution does is it purifies the church. The cowards flee. Now, what's interesting, you would think, and when you read church history, you, you see this time and time and time again. When persecution hits the church, you would think that the church would shrivel up and die. That's not what happens. Even though there's an exodus out of the church from the counterfeit believers. Because they're there if, it's, uh, if they can hand out their business cards. They are there if they can make some business contacts. They are there for the uh, ice cream socials. They're there for whatever reason. But they're not there for the gospel. They're not there to be, uh, become disciples of Christ. They're not there to grow in the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's just another activity on their calendar. Even, even when persecution hits and the false believers leave, you would think the church would shrink. But what happens under persecution is that the church begins to grow. You look around the world right now, at the places of the most intense persecution, that's where the church is growing faster than anywhere else in the world. The church is growing faster in Iran than anywhere else in the world right now. Iran. Iran. There are two pastors I pray for from time to time as they come to my mind because I read about them four or five years ago. Uh, pastors, wives, children, incarcerated, they were both given the opportunity to be released, as John Bunyan was, if they would not preach the gospel. They both declined the offer. 
And they're still in there now. They're still in there. Is it hard? You bet it's hard. Is it difficult? Absolutely it's difficult. But these are men who are sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not cowards. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not cowards. And let me give you three reasons why they weren't cowards. Number one, number one, they stood tall instead of bowing down. They stood tall instead of bowing down. We'll come back to these. Secondly, they stood, they stood firm against the political and cultural pressures. They stood firm against the political and cultural pressures. We're seeing political and cultural pressures like we've never seen before in the history of this nation. Number three, they stood, they stood strong when the heat was turned up. They stood strong when the heat was turned up. Let's go back to the first one. They stood tall instead of bowing down. Let's go to Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits. That's uh, a 10-story building, the height of a 10-story building. Now, why did he make an image of gold? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, he had a dream. If you were here last week, we talked about this. And he saw a great statue. And then Daniel interprets the dream and gives the interpretation to him in Verse 37, he says, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. Now, this statue that he saw in his dream, it had a head of gold, but then there were other components that made up this statue, and they're explained in Daniel's interpretation to the king. But apparently, this, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the most powerful king on the face of the earth, Babylon at this time was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, he, he really liked that idea that he was the head of gold. He kind of missed the whole point. The whole point was and he kind of missed this, that after talking about that you're the head of gold, there's going to come another kingdom after you because you're going to die, as all kings do. They all die. We all die. And then someone else is going to take over, and then someone else is going to take over, and then someone else is going to take over. He missed that. So apparently, he really liked that idea, so he makes a statue, uh, probably of himself, and not just the head was gold, the whole thing was gold, 10 stories high. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, out on a plain, open area, so that hundreds of thousands of people could come from the city and come and worship. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors. Uh, this would be the, uh, the hierarchy of government officials, the bureaucracy, uh, the deep state, the federal agencies, they're all in here. The governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then, I'll just call him the deep state instead of going through the names again. They were assembled for the dedication, verse 3, of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you the command is given, O people, nations, and men of every language, that at the, moment, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, obviously the Babylonian symphony orchestra was here, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. 
7. Therefore, at that time, all the people heard the sound of the orchestra. All the people, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. There were thousands of Jews here. Jews that in their heart knew that was wrong. And they went ahead and bowed. They went ahead and compromised. They, uh, they rationalized it in their hearts even though they knew it was wrong. Why did they know it was wrong? Exodus chapter 20. Let's flip over there. In Exodus chapter 20, we find the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of your house of slavery. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall have no gods ahead of me. You shall have no gods that you prefer in my place, is the idea. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. You shall not worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Um, there were three men who, didn't, who did not bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood tall instead of bowing down. You had all kinds of Jews who knew Exodus 20. It had been drilled into them since they were little kids. They knew what they were doing was wrong, but they didn't want to take the consequences, and they capitulated, and they compromised, and they gave in. So they bowed down instead of standing tall. It's interesting, over the last six months, suddenly we're seeing people on the street, it's being caught on video, someone will come up, try to intimidate them, and tell them to bow down. You don't bow down. You don't bow down to an ideology. You don't bow down to any God, any false teaching. We bow before Christ and Christ alone. I mean, it's all changed so suddenly. So you've got to be prepared for this now. And before, we never thought about it. But everything has changed. Everything's been turned upside down. Everything's out of whack. Everything's out of control. Seemingly. So this is stuff that applies to us. I mean, how do you know that sometime next week someone's not going to come up to you and say, bow down? What are you going to do? Well, they wouldn't bow down. Eric Ortland, in his commentary, said this of these three men. They did not know what God would do, but they knew what they would not do. That's a great line. They didn't know how this was going to turn out. I'll say it again. They did not know what God would do, but they knew what they would not do. You have to know what you will not do before the situation arises. Good football coaches prepare their players for what they're going to face in the next game, they, um, you have offensive coordinators, you have defensive coordinators. They're, all, they're always watching, they're always watching. They used to watch film, now they're watching video. And they'll get their players in there, they'll get the defense in there, and then they'll keep running plays of their opponent's game from last week. And you see how they run this offense? You see how they run this? You see this guy's in the slot. When that guy splits wide, they usually run this or this. So be aware of it. They're preparing them for what they know they're going to face before they ever face it. Now, that's where we are right now. You've got to prepare yourself biblically for what we never really have had to think about before. But it's only going to increase, and it's going to get worse. That's the spirit of the age that we're in. Matthew 10, 28 applies dramatically to, um, to our times. Not even necessarily last year, but right now it certainly applies. Matthew 10, 
28, Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, this verse has always applied, but it hasn't applied to us in America because we haven't had persecution. We haven't had on the streets what we're having now. People in other countries have dealt with this. But we've had liberty, we've had freedom, we've had a nice ride for a couple hundred years and change. But it's all changing. So this is a good verse. Do not fear those who kill the body. This is exactly what the three men in Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is exactly what they did. They did not fear those who could kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fill fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God. Don't fear man, fear God. That's where you want, that. 14 times in the book of Proverbs, it talks about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is clean. There are great benefits to fearing God, and he deserves to be feared. Not in the sense that you're, you walk around in terror, but that you're in absolute awe of who he is and his character and his majesty and his power and his goodness and his holiness. He's a savior. Secondly, these men were not cowards because they, st they stood firm against political and cultural pressure. They stood firm against political and cultural pressure. You go back to Daniel 3 and you, I mean, we really should be able to identify with this right now because it's very current. When I was in elementary school, we used to have a, a subject called current events. And we used to get every, we, we had this little newspaper called the Weekly Reader. And it would tell us what was going on currently because back then when I was in elementary school, the internet was down <laughs> uh, permanently. And so you had to wait, you had to wait for the news at six o'clock. And there was a guy who did the sports, but the sports segment was three minutes long. And all three channels, and there are only three channels, they all follow the same schedule. So if you caught the sports and you thought, well, when this guy's over, I'll go over to channel five. Well, no, they were in sync. So there's three minutes of sports. Now we got 24 hours of sports. ESPN, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, constant sports. I mean, we, we, we got information out of a fire hose. I mean, you, you can't even, it'll knock you over. Note, note this, uh, he's got the bureaucrats, he's got the deep states, they're all upset because if you go back up to Daniel 2, when Daniel interpreted the dream for the king that the Lord had revealed to him, and he and his three buddies had prayed that the Lord, Lord, he wants to know what he dreamt. Would you show us what this man dreamt? Because you put the dream in his heart and his mind. And God did that. And so, Daniel gives the interpretation, and because it was right on, it, it, I mean, it, was, it, it, was, it, it nailed every single detail. 48, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel was number two in the whole kingdom. And Daniel made request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon. And Daniel was at the king's court. And all those bureaucrats were so pleased that these three Hebrews had been promoted. No, they weren't. They hated them. They hated them. 
and they started to come up with a dossier. And they started to come up with a conspiracy. And they said, I mean, it's human nature. They resented them, they were embittered towards them, and they wanted to take them down. They didn't want those guys in power. They wanted that power. They deserved that power. And this, this whole deal with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he had all of his counselors, he has all of his advisors. I'm, you know, this guy just didn't come up with it by himself. He ran it by them. They all, you know, everyone's getting involved. They're, you know how this stuff works. And so there was great pressure put upon them to bow down, to bow down politically, culturally. If you haven't faced this at work, you will. Uh, This, there, there are deceptive teachings that are, that are obviously in the world, but they make their way into the church as well. I don't want to get off on that too much, but the Christians at Berea were were more noble than the ones at Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. Book of Acts says, Whenever you hear something, you're taught something, you hear this, you compare it to the Word of God. Is that in the Scripture? I I mentioned a couple of times in here, and I'll mention it again, because if you haven't run into it, you're going to run into it, or it's going to run into you, that there are Christian books, quote-unquote Christian books, written by Christian publishers on intersectionality and critical race theory And in order to resolve racial tension in the church, you gather large groups, groups of white people, and what they do is they confess their sin racially and the sins of their ancestors. Now, the problem with that is Deuteronomy 24, which says that a son is not responsible for the sins of his father. Now that's pretty clear, and that's not the only place you'll find that in scripture. But this entire strategy, this entire teaching is absolutely counter to the word of God. It's, It's social justice, it's not biblical justice. It's a false justice. And if you stand up and say that, they're not going to like you. Just know that. But you don't need to be liked. You need to be respected. And you want to please the Lord. So there's this pressure culturally that if you don't bow down, you're going to die. You're going to die. Back to Daniel 3. Um, And we've already read this, but I'll I'll, I'll go back to verse 11 of Daniel 3. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And these are, the, uh, these are the bureaucrats. These are the deep state guys going to the king. And they say there are certain Jews who you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the symphony orchestra. 
fall down and worship the image that I have made, then very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? I mean, this guy is just asking for it. The hubris. What God is there that can deliver you out of my hands? Well, the God who interpreted the dream that made you buy an extra case of depends in Daniel chapter 2. That God. He's our God. The one that told you the future. The one who is king of kings and lord of lords. The one who created you and put this in, posi in this position. That's our God. That's the God who can deliver us. Now, they don't say that, but that's what he should have known and it's what he should have remembered. But again, when you have power and you have absolute power, you get hubris. And you get full of yourself. And you think higher of yourself than you should. And a man like this needs to be humbled, and he will be humbled, as we will see when we get together next. Which might be in the clouds, for all I know. And I'd be all for that, and I think you would too. But uh, we'll pick up Daniel again Lord willing, next year. And we'll see how the Lord humbled him. But for now, what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. Now see, that's what you call political and cultural pressure. That's a little bit of pressure. You're going to burn in the fire. And now he's going to, he's going to actually put a little more pressure on them because of their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered. I love that. <laughs> you ever seen somebody's facial expression altered? Boy, I mean, that's the beauty of understatement, huh? I mean, this guy was, he was mad. I mean, he's the king. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heat, heated. That's a little bit more cultural and political pressure. Now, in his insanity, see, here's what happens when someone gets angry. They don't think. And see, the reason he wanted to heat it seven times more, that's hyperbole. They're going to heat it as hot as it can possibly get. Is he wanted them to suffer. But because he's angry, he's not thinking straight. If he wanted them to suffer more, what he should have done is cooled it down. But to, hot, to, but to heat it seven times higher, it's instantaneous death. They're not going to suffer at all. But see, he's not thinking straight. Let's hold our place there, and then let's turn over to John 11. 25. So these guys aren't cowards. Oh, king, we don't even need to give you an answer. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. How, how could they have such an attitude? How could they have such uh, confidence? There is a book that is worth reading. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It was written by John Fox. It's about the history of martyrs in the Christian church all the way up until the time of the Puritans. Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary, they called her, um, killed hundreds of Christians who believed in the scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ. Men, women, children. What's interesting is 
the accounts that Fox gives and how many of them, even children, had a confidence, had a... um, And then you had every once in a while, someone would recant. They would lose heart, and they would recant. And then they would be ashamed, and then they would ask again that they could face the fire. I forget which individual it was, but he was afraid of the, the being burned at the stake, and he recanted his faith. And they put him back in the prison, and then he was so overwhelmed with guilt that he denied Christ, he said No. Lord, give me the grace and mercy to face this. And he had to sign a recantation. And he was so ashamed of himself that when they took him to the fire, the hand which he used to sign denying Christ, he put that hand in the fire first. Now, how does someone do that? I think there is a presence of the Holy Spirit. Because some of those guys were not crying out in pain as they were being burned at the stake. They were preaching the gospel. That that is a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. Matthew, no, John 11, 25, that's where I'm going. See, they understood this truth, John 11, 25, When Jesus went to see Lazarus, Jesus waited. He delayed on purpose. And it was for a reason. Because if you heard he was sick, if he had just shown up, what happens when Jesus shows up around sick people? Well, they get healed. But he had another purpose. So he stayed away on purpose. And so he shows up. And in verse 21 of John 11, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Watch this. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they believe that. It doesn't matter, King. We don't need to give you an answer. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. That's a confidence. That's a confidence that comes from the Holy Spirit and comes from the Word of God. So... They stood strong when the heat was turned up. And back to Daniel 3. Go down to verse 19 again. Uh, His facial expression was altered. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. 22, for this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew the men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It killed them, the guards. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. He was close. It was the son of God. It was the Lord Jesus Christ walking around with those guys in there. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. Isn't that interesting? Kind of changed his tune a little bit. And what God is there that can deliver you from my power? And now he's calling God the Most High God. See, he knew about God. 
He knew about him. He just hasn't, he hadn't bowed his knee. He hadn't bowed his heart to the God that he knew to be true. Later, he will. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the deep state, all those guys saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. That is astonishing. That is the power of God. The power not only in the furnace to keep them, to save them, but when they come out, they're not calling some fire restoration company to take their robes. Not even the scent of smoke. Nebuchadnezzar responded, 28, said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his, actually, he didn't know who it was. It was the Lord Jesus. It was a theophany. Delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. That's what happens here. That's not what always happens. Go over to Hebrews chapter 11. I signed up with different ministries for email alerts and some mission agencies. The, the Christians that are being beheaded in Nigeria, the young girls that are being kidnapped, sexually assaulted, the women that are being raped, I get emails, I, I want to say five out of seven days, just for those dear people in Nigeria who love Lord Jesus Christ. North Korea, what's happening there to believers. China, Iran. God does not always deliver us on earth from persecution. In Hebrews 11, which is God's hall of fame, those in God's hall of fame are those who walk by faith In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then it mentions different men and some women in the Old Testament who walk with God, Noah, uh, Sarah, Abraham, uh, others, Moses, now, they all dealt with hardship. They all dealt with adversity. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. We're all going to go through stuff. There are different levels of suffering, and there are different kinds of suffering. We have not had to deal with what Christians in Nigeria and some of these communist countries and Muslim countries are having to deal with. Why have we not had to deal with that? We've been delivered from it, quite frankly. But, but they haven't. Why is that? There's actually no answer. That's, that's, that's only something that God knows. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. But the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. There are some things we don't have answers for on this earth. On this earth. C.S. Lewis knew a lot about grief. He knew a lot about pain and hardship. Didn't marry until later in life. His wife developed cancer. They were only married several years, and she died, went to be with the Lord. It just crushed him. He wrote a book called A Grief Observed. He understood grief because he grieved deeply. Lewis made the statement one time that he believed that when we would take our last breath and go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would look around and the first words out of our mouths would be, of course. Huh. Of course. 
what we don't understand on earth. See, now we look in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. What we don't understand now, we will understand then, and it will be, we'll look around and we'll go, huh. Hmm. The goodness of God. The goodness of God, which we cannot see right now. So in the midst, as our questions are not answered, Job suffered, and when the Lord appeared to him, the Lord never gave him an explanation for the suffering. God is God. We are not. We trust him. Even though we don't understand, we don't have the capacity to understand his ways. Isaiah 55, 8, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. I want to finish by asking this question. Would it not have been easier? <clears throat> now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were miraculously delivered, and we thank God for that. But not every believer has been remarkably delivered because in Hebrews 11, which I almost forgot to read, verse 32, what more can I say for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdom, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lion, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. They had great deliverances from suffering. They won great victories. Then 35, women received back their dead by resurrection. But watch this, others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised on the earth, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We all have different afflictions. And no one wants to be afflicted. No one wants to suffer. No one wants to have pain. This is why some professing Christians, this is why some Jews back there went ahead and bowed. They didn't stand tall, they bowed. Why? They didn't want to suffer. So what did they do? They, uh, they, instead of relying completely on God, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, instead of having a reliance upon God, they compromised. And they made an evil alliance in order to save their lives and to save their well-being and to save their health and to save their financial statements. Where we are right now, we're, um, we're having to decide how we're going to live our lives as believers. And very quickly, I'd ask you to turn over to Isaiah 30 as we finish up. Why are we going to Isaiah 30? Because Isaiah 30 is about making an evil alliance instead of living in reliance upon the living God. When there's, hey, when there's no cultural pressure, when there's no political pressure, uh, you don't have much to worry about. But when the pressure heats up, and it's heating up, and it's going to continue to heat up. You got to decide 
what you're going to do. And the easy way out and the coward's way out is to make an alliance with someone you think can help you. That's why so many of the Jews bowed down, even though they knew it was wrong. They compromised and made an, an alliance which was evil. Uh, Isaiah 30, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, watch this, but not mine. Uh, the context is they were afraid of the nation of Assyria, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. So their plan is to go down to Egypt and to pay Egypt to protect them from Assyria. That's the plan. Hezekiah is the king. His advisors are advising him this way without going through a bunch of verses in the book. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine, and make an alliance but not of my spirit, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh. Not safety in the Lord, safety in this human man. Then you get down to verse 15, and this is serious stuff because they have done this, and the Lord is calling them to repent. Verse 15, for thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, in repentance and rest you will be saved. Not in this plan, not in some human compromise, not in some evil alliance. Alliance is not going to save you. Compromise is not going to save you. Reliance upon me is where you want to be. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. We're up against governmental pressure, cultural pressure, political pressure. About 15 years ago, our ministry was audited by the IRS, and a lot of ministries were being audited at that time. And then the ministry came out all right, and then I got a letter they were going to audit me. And the Lord brought along two men, very capable, very gifted. This is what they do. They were committed to the Lord. And the Lord just brought them along, and they represented the ministry and my, me. And after a time, we were told, well, you'll have, you know, this, we'll have this, we'll have this resolved by this and this. And it just kept being extended and extended and extended. And these guys who weren't extreme at all, they said to me one day, they said, you know, there's something unusual about this. We think this is coming from up high somewhere. And by that, they meant D.C. And, well, how do you fight that? How do you take that on? And um, I had a few nights, not a lot, I had a few nights where I couldn't sleep and I'd get up and print out, I already had the QuickBooks report printed out and I was going through everything looking for anything. I was just looking for anything where I made a mistake. I mean, I, I was just, I kind of got OCD or OCB, whatever it is, I don't know, whatever it is, I probably have it. But I mean, I just got real fixated on this and not, it didn't last long, it was several nights. And one morning, I woke up, and all I can tell you, and th this is very unusual for me. It's so unusual that it never happens to me. But it happened this time. I woke up, and when I woke up, my first conscious thought was Isaiah 30. I didn't hear a voice. I, I, it was just Isaiah 30, I mean Isaiah 30. What's in Isaiah 30? I didn't know it was in Isaiah 30. So I got into my office. I'm reading Isaiah 30, what I just read. Alliance, not alliance, but reliance. And I thought, what does H.C. Leupold say about this? An old Lutheran commentator. It's pretty good. And uh, this is what I wrote down that morning. He says this, this passage, verses 15 to 18, deals with the subject of not alliances, but reliance. It says, if you return, or the idea is, if you re repent. Return happens to be the word usually used for repentance. 
That's an interesting verse. In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Uh, Have you had a lot of quietness and trust lately with what's going on around us? Probably not so much. He goes on and says, primarily this means to turn aside from the unwholesome policy that controls the thinking of the nation in Isaiah 30. Then it behooves the nation, oh, uh, that controls the thinking of the nation, in short, the alliance with Egypt. After this is abandoned, then it behooves the nation to wait calmly. There are times, catch this, there are times when the danger threatening is beyond man's ability to control the situation. I was up against the IRS. I had a great tax attorney and a great CPA, and we had all the stuff and all the records. And it all turned out all right, but at the time, I didn't know it was going to. But see, I underlined that. There are times when the danger threatening is beyond man's ability to control the situation. Are we going to lose our house? Are we going to lose our home? Are we going to, did I screw up? See, right now, we're wondering, are we going to lose our republic? Are we going to lose our democracy? Is this thing going to be stolen? All that is left is to wait on the Lord. Such a situation prevails in this case. This is further spelled out as involving to remain quiet and maintain confidence. If this approach be used, the nation will be ultimately rescued and at the same time will be strong. For seemingly passive reliance on the Lord is not weakness, it is actually strength. We're in a situation right now where there's not a whole lot we can do about the future of the nation. We can pray. And we should be praying. But out of this text, which helped me in my situation, I've thought about this text again over the last couple of days. Three points. As you're praying, here are three things as you rely upon God. Wait calmly. Where is this going? We don't know, but he knows. Wait calmly. Number two, Remain quiet. Remain quiet. Don't get all stirred up. Number three, maintain confidence. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's the one in charge. He's the one who can do something. He's the one who can be trusted. That calms me down. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And he will. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your involvement in all the details of the affairs of this world. We pray that you would bring into the light what has been done in the darkness. We pray that you would be merciful. We pray that you would calm and quiet our hearts as we look to you. And in other situations in our lives, if we're compromising, if we're considering an evil alliance, stop us dead in our tracks and cause us to repent and turn and run to you and trust in you alone to be our deliverer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.